Welcome back to Bulletproof Mindset, Scotland's number one health, fitness and entertainment podcast. So today we welcome another special guest to our show and that is Louise Westra. Now Louise has been in the health and fitness space for a number of years and has so much experience and so much value to offer in today's conversation. So we most definitely will be bringing her on for part two where we're going to do a deep dive into women's health, menopause, periods, how to train around them and all that good stuff. Now in today's conversation we of course get into Louise's background, her story and then we start talking about a number of different things that can affect her health, more so in her gut. This was such a fascinating conversation and the two hours absolutely flew in. Now, we had such a good time recording this, and I'm sure you guys are going to enjoy this, so make sure you check out Louise's uh, social channels and our website and whatnot. We're going to leave links to that below. Now, Louise's message is also around building your biological resilience, and if you don't know what that is, then don't worry, we cover that off in today's episode, but you can find all her details below in the show notes, and you can find her on Instagram at Louise Westra Health. Now, before we get into the show... If you do enjoy today's conversation, the best way that you can support us is by leaving us a five-star rating on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you choose to listen to this. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below. What did you think of today's chat? What questions do you have for us? Because this certainly will be a two-part series, and Louise for sure will be back on the show. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Listen to a good bit of your book as well, and done. you've done a fair few podcasts over the last year and that sort of stuff. You've been in the what you would call the health and wellness or well-being industry for well over 20 years. So I think for probably start, what got you into that and, and actually hearing your story and on your website, you, what your what your grandmom's, uh, grandmother said to you and all that sort of stuff. So take us back to that point. Is that, is that where it all began for you? Yeah, I mean, I can still see myself at about 14, 15, certainly mid-teens. Right. And my grandmother, who at that stage lived in a care home, sadly, um, she she made that comment. Yeah. And for it clearly stuck with me because, as you say, I wrote it in my book, which came out now what, about a year and a half ago, roughly. And it it really was. I didn't know at that point in my teenage years how much of a defining moment it would really be, mm-hmm. but it did resonate very, very deeply. And I think at that time I was in a relatively dark place. Yeah. Mm. I do have around me uh, family members that have been significantly depressed. Again, I talked about this in my book. My father uh, had had uh, challenges with his mental health mm. for really, you know, the whole of my life that I remember. Mm. And some of that, of course, would have come from what he witnessed around him. It's never, you know, nature or nurture. It's a combination of things. Yeah, yeah. And I had some of that going on for myself. But because there wasn't an open conversation that was invited within our home, it became something that I didn't talk about. I held it very, very Mm -hmm. deeply inside of me. I was and still am an introvert, despite if you know spent time with yeah, me. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm very enthusiastic and very passionate about what I do, but yeah. I am essentially an introvert. We spoke mm. about this. It was very open that we are. I would consider myself introverted as well, as much as people are like, you're not introverted. You talk to the camera and you do these podcasts and all that sort of stuff. And um, for those that are listening, the what your what your grand uh, is it grandmother's that yeah. Uh, yeah what your grandmother said to you was that. Um, if you had your health, you had everything that you needed just for, for the guys that are listening. So what, what age are you at this point? I think around 15. Okay. Um, the, the sad, the really sad part about that story is that my grandmother subsequently died of excessive medication. Yeah. So she had been unwell my entire life. So I hadn't ever known her to be anything other than quite morose, you know, spending most of her time sitting in an armchair in what was then her and my grandfather's like house in secure, like a secure residential facility. So they lived independently, but there was somebody there if needed, theoretically. Um, So I only ever really knew her as depressed, smoking, not eating great food, not being kind of joyful, vibrant, just really, really low energy. And she had her first heart attack when my mother was pregnant with me. Of course, what I didn't know when I was much, much younger is that there's an imprinting that happens on infants before they're even born that comes from the The experience in Mm -hmm. utero. Mm -hmm. So 
when my mother, you know, got the news that her mother had had this massive heart attack. Yeah, and at that stage, she didn't know if she was going to live. And then she had a series of, of subsequent smaller heart attacks. And then she had a pacemaker. Mm -hmm. I was inside her experiencing all those stress Motions, hormones. Yeah. yeah, it's so fascinating that that happens from pre-birth like before you, the day that you're born um similar to nutrition and so w from from the age of 15 like how are you navigating your journey and what you want to do with life that's led you to where you are today so at that stage i was academically quite adept so i was at an all girls uh school it wasn't a private school mm. But it was uh, funneled, if you like, at age 11 in England. We had this thing called the 11 plus. Okay. So, you know, you take the 11 plus, it's an exam, might be a series of exams now, and you either get sent to the grammar school, okay. you know, which is academically yeah. considered to be here, or you go to the other school. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, now I'm older, I look at that and I just think that is fucked up in terms of, <laughs> you know, yeah, some people are left feeling yeah. like... Yeah. Shape. Yeah. Sure. And and interestingly, my sister, who's a few years younger than me, she passed the 11 plus. She would have done much, much better had she not been at that school. Because firstly, as soon as I was excelling in things like A-levels, then everyone was like, oh, you're Louise Westra's sister. Mm. Oh, we expect great things of you. And that applied a pressure to her, which was really unfair because yeah. she wasn't academically as, you know, she just wasn't that inclined. Yeah. She's a brilliant primary school teacher, but she ended up failing her exams and having to go a completely different route yeah. to get to what was fundamentally her purpose. She would have been much better off in a different school. Mm. Yeah. So I was performing at a high level. You know, I was kind of hitting all the, you know, three grade A, A levels. I didn't have A plus, A star, all it's that stuff. all the difference. That it's even so changed, changed, changed so big time. Right? <laughs> um, and I still, even though I've lived in Scotland for like 11 years, I still don't really understand the whole thing. <laughs> How it works here. <laughs> we don't either. Don't no, we don't. Like, I think it's it's changed it. since we've left school as well. Okay. Completely okay. different again. That makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was also working a lot on weekends because my parents had their own business. My dad was a workaholic. Mm. Uh, so essentially I was at school five days a week excelling in the classroom or you know certainly doing my best i wasn't super like brainy but i was a grafter mm -hmm. yeah yeah. Study learning. yeah and i really was probably you know a people pleaser i wanted to do well i wanted my parents to be proud of yeah, me yeah. um and everyone around me was excelling so it you know you you just kind of get i got on with it yeah, natural I, environment. yeah i was also uh playing netball at a really high level and then i was working on the weekends cool so pretty. So seven days a week. Yeah. Hence, by the time I got to the end of my twenties, I was burnt out. Mm. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Like, funny you bring that up. Yeah. Yeah, because we were we were wanting to speak about that because we were listening to a podcast and we were talking about burnout. And suddenly you mentioned there was a pressure on your sister, and I think that's a, like, a big thing these days. The pressure is higher than ever to on social media to match them mentorships. There's so many people putting out, "I'm making this much money. I'm doing this well," and the pressure is higher than ever. So how do you feel that? Like, that would have affected your sister then like to what degree i think for my sister she well i know what happened with my sister she's very she's she's very very sweet mm -hmm. at that stage she really believed that some of her friends who were like you know going to cambridge oxford mm -hmm. offered unconditional offers of two e's and stuff she but are going to get they're going to get three or four a's in that in the or that this was at gcse level they were, so they were going to get like, you know, nine A's mm. or whatever. She really believed them when they said, oh, I'm not really, I'm not really, you know, rising. But they were going for it. Of course they mm. were. Mm -hmm. But that was the flex, right? Yeah. And so she didn't put the work in to the degree that she perhaps could have done to have got some fairly respectable, what would have been respectable grades mm. within our school. And I don't exactly even know now what, can't remember what her grades were, but it did mean that she couldn't go on and do the subjects that she wanted to at the next level, A level, to then go yeah. on and do a degree in teaching. Mm -hmm. So she, my mum found out what was happening at the local college. She went there, she started off with like a nursery nurse qualification, equivalent to what, like an N? Yeah, and... Uh 
yeah, 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 yeah that, whatever, whatever they're, they're called now. Yeah, Something. yeah, whatever they're called. I have no idea. I always get a cue in it. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll go with MVQ. that. We'll go with that. And then she went to the next level, mm -hmm. and then she went to the next level, and then eventually she went and did her Bachelor of Education. Ah, right, okay. As I say, she's a phenomenal teacher. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I guess to, to your point about the pressures on people in More than now, these days. Because um, that's 30 plus years ago. <laughs> Crazy. Um, the, yeah, if we are looking outside and seeing what other people doing are doing and thinking there's no way I could mm -hmm. actually do that or I'm so far away from that that it doesn't even seem possible, yeah. then do we talk ourselves into actually downgrading what's, we're, possible, we're, we're, what's possible for, for us? us. Mm -hmm. That's, it's funny you mention that because I came from when I left school, uh, I stayed right on our equivalent six year, which I think is year 11 for you guys, or was it, might be wrong, but it's the last year of high school, Let's basically. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't have any hires or any further education. I seen all my friend group go to uni and I felt like a bit of a failure. And that carried on with me for a couple of years after that, that I always felt the need to tell people how much money I was making as a comparative flex because yeah. they had went to uni. I thought uni was the, was if you went to uni, you're the smart cookie. If you don't go to uni, then yeah. you failed. You've, you've, you've almost failed. And what a, what a looking back at that, I'm like, nah, it's actually the best thing that happened to me was getting into actual work and that sort of stuff. One of my yeah. most successful clients in terms of talking about wealth, mm -hmm. uh, they were expelled from school because mm -hmm. they were, you know, disruptive. Yeah. And they are dyslexic, certainly. I don't know if they have dyscalculia, dyscalculia. I don't think they do, but they, you know, they have now for the last X number of years been earning eight figures That's awesome. a year. And, you, and we think we're, we think <laughs> we're right, so... Because they've got a business brain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We think we're so defined by school and education and you just, you, there's so much that we hold to it. Mm -hmm. So... You sort of, it sounds like you, for me, I looked at uh, reading books and that just was not my forte, but from your side of you, it sounds like you liked the literature side. I loved side. books, yeah, yeah. so I think I had that in my, I was a, I was a, um, I, I love reading, I've mm. always loved reading, and I just think I didn't have anyone who helped me to understand that firstly, it was very, the the time that we spend in education is very, very finite. Mm -hmm. So it did feel like it was really, really more important than I now know it is. Yeah, and that's yeah. the approach that I take with my children now is that, you know, this there's is more, not the be all and end all. One stepping stone in your journey. It yeah. is not everything. In fact, we've had discussions uh, with our eldest about him coming out of mainstream, the mainstream system for various mm. reasons at different times. And yeah, I'm not, I, I don't for a minute, I think it's a trap. I think, I think it's a trap that I was, wasn't made aware of mm -hmm. because as I, certainly as I progressed, thankfully I had the wherewithal when I had done my A-levels and my school wanted to use me to, uh, they wanted to pull me out and put me into clearing okay. to see if I could get into Oxford. Because that would have been then great the for them, right? Yeah. For the school, no for you. Yeah. But thankfully, because of a couple of things, one in particular thing that happened, which was very tragic, that a, a young woman in my year group who was earmarked to go to Cambridge, she only had to basically turn up at the exams and pretty much write her name to get in. <laughs> of course, she wasn't. She was going to ace all four of yeah, her yeah, A-levels. Yeah. That's just how she was. She was obviously feeling the pressure so significantly that she took an overdose of paracetamol during our exam period. Oh, wow. And the hospital delayed getting her the intervention and uh, it came out later that her life could have been saved. But unfortunately, her, you'll have to put a trigger warning yeah, on Yeah, you know, no, 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 <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, this is quite a raw podcast anyway, yeah, so the yeah. listeners know what to expect. Um, that she, uh, she basically died. Mm. And that was another thing that really stuck with me. And so when it was suggested that I you know, pull out from the place that I had at the University of Wales, Swansea, to read English and French, I was like, nah, mm. I don't need that level of pressure. That pressure, yeah. Because I knew that if I did go to Oxford, because as I say, I was not an academic mm. brain like this young woman was, I would have had to have really 
used all my time, energy and resources to just be working on my subject. And again, I think probably knowing unconsciously being so like not not necessarily even having that that self-awareness but unconsciously realizing that because of my family's history on my father's side that that could tip me over the edge yeah yeah and actually subsequently in life there have been a couple of occasions one in particular where i have had suicidal ideation yeah so i, I want because to be, of the pressure yeah yeah, yeah. and it's, it's funny you say that because i think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves whether it's our health and fitness journey or it's the job that we have it's the money that we make it's whatever in life i think we always to james's point there you're seeing snapshots of other people's lives of wow how can how can i not do that so the status of going to cambridge almost outweighs the 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 work that's needed to put into that for for where you're at from that side of it. The um, the other day, just as a maybe a slight tangent, but it just <laughs> it's popped into my head, so I feel like it is relevant. I was walking home with my youngest from school. It was actually probably a couple of weeks after we'd gone back in August, so maybe the start of September. And there's another school in our town, another primary school. And uh, Mum was walking back from that primary school. And, we were crossing the field and I heard her saying to her little boy who was probably five or six, well, you know, if you don't want to do the homework, that's fine, but you'll just have to let your teacher, so-and-so, know and she'll probably think you're lazy. I was like, what the fuck? Why would you say that to a five or six-year-old kid mm. who's thinking now, if I don't do this stuff, I'm lazy. Like, yeah. there's something Gel wrong with me mm. And I just have such an, I actually have a real issue with homework. So I don't enforce homework at all. If our kids are interested in it, we do it with them. Our youngest does have some challenges around um, speech and language uh, for, for various reasons. So we have got some one-to-one -one support and I recognize the privilege of being able to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we're doing that because his confidence last year was just slipping, 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 slipping. But again, this idea that, you know, we should go home from school. They've been there from nine o'clock in the morning to three o'clock in the afternoon. And then they have to do this extra kind of labor. I just think that's part of creating a workforce that thinks that they should be paid from nine to five or six, but be working for two or three extra hours every week or day. Yeah. And that that's an established standard within life, corporations. Within life. There's an argument that school or school and education preps people for that I those employees 100 yeah, yeah. percent um which is which is interesting so so diversity a little bit so you you hit burnout then so what was have you i would imagine we're all exposed to this throughout life for various different reasons what was this like for you at the age of 20 20 years old sure. yeah so uh 20 around 26 okay yeah 26 20 actually 28 so it was in australia mm -hmm. um i'd gone traveling after my first degree Okay. I met my husband. We got married very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, literally six months to the day. Your breath taken away, this big... No, I was in an hug. accident. He caught me after a concussion. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, for real? <laughs> yeah, but we have been married so 25 years. So all you're saying is I need to go to a road traffic accident. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need to do. That's easy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I had left the UK with the idea that I was an around-the-world ticket. Mm. But as it was, I ended up staying in Australia. Suddenly I felt like I was, you know, we, we had bought a house. It was all, it was all quite a lot. Mm. Um, but, you know, as I say, that's ended up absolutely fine. <laughs> the, the challenge was that then we had this mortgage and we, it was very, very small. But at that time, you know, it was a big felt responsibility. Huge. And I, so I was trying to work and also study. So I was studying to become a naturopath, which is a you know um, much more common term in Australia than it is here in the yeah. UK. So I was studying where I lived, it was a it was a three hour, roughly two and a half to three hours on the train to get to where I studied. Um, so it's and almost like London lifestyle, but pretty America. much, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then I needed to also be working, or I certainly felt like I needed to be contributing in the house. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up trying to squeeze about eight days worth of work and study into seven days. Now, mm. it's a different way of living in Australia in some ways, but I can tell you that there's still only the same number of days in the week. <laughs> so it doesn't yeah. work. But because, again, I had really only had role models that were 
essentially workaholics, you know, it, there was no work smarter, work, you know, rather that than work harder. It was just work know. hard, work yeah. hard, graft. That's what you do. Yeah, yeah. That by the time I got to the end of the four or so years that I was studying and finished that and, and came out and was ready to work, I had depleted myself so, so much that I could barely get off the sofa. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't know at that time was that I had drained my thyroid in particular. And in women, the thyroid Mm. is, I liken it sometimes to like the canary in the mine. Right. It's the first organ that often is trying to tell us all is not well. Yeah. But again, because most of us have not had an education about this vehicle that's taken mm. us through life, you know, we, we, we spend more time reading or potentially even flicking through the manual of our car that on average we'll have for seven or eight years. But we know fuck all about our body. Mm-hmm. And even though I'd been at, at you know, college Doing, learning yeah, pecking, about my body, us, yeah. I was still like, this doesn't make any sense. But the reason it didn't make sense was because I kept going to the doctor and saying, I think there might be a problem with my thyroid and all the markers kept coming back within normal range. So from the medical paradigm's perspective, there was nothing wrong. Mm. And this is the thing that most people don't realize. Just because nothing is wrong, it doesn't mean that everything is working as well as it could. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So it took me a little while to figure that out myself. Mm -hmm. And then it took me a good, probably fully two years to feel like my energy was pretty good mm. but longer to really continue to repair some of the damage yeah and that, i think that's what people don't realize the shortening your the hours that you sleep or shoveling in maybe the not paying attention to the food that you consume not paying attention to how much you spend outdoors all these are ha, have long impacts on your on your health that, that can be reversed but in order to, to reverse them can take longer and in some cases might not be even possible yeah and i mean in the 20 years i i laughing i laughingly put this on social media sometimes but in the 20 years that i've been doing this work no one has ever come to me and said i'm so pleased i waited <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm so pleased i waited and for me it was mm. i'm so pleased you know of course i'm not pleased because i had I mean, and I'd had that for for several years. It wasn't as bad as it had been, but I'd had like a really severe irritable bowel syndrome. Mm. Um, I had this under-functioning thyroid. I'd had anxiety, depression, even in my teens, even though I didn't have really the the language to talk about it or Mm. the space to be able to share it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'd had also what would have been now uh, recognized as and diagnosed as PMDD, so like a really severe form of PMS. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I put my foot through a door once, which I heard this on one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you hear, yeah. So like, and and for those, uh, obviously, the, the I'm guys a nice tuning person. in. I know, like, like, you've spent time with me. I know, me, like, right? you're, you're such a, <laughs> such a sweetheart. Like a I never thought you would <laughs> have the uh, emotional anger to kick a door <laughs> or like, even push someone. Back yeah, again yeah. to those patterns that you learn as a child that it's not safe to share, and it's not that anyone was. You know, I, I'm I'm very fortunate. I grew up in a loving home, mm-hmm. but you know, there was some there was some stuff that both my parents were dealing with, as we all are, yeah. that they didn't know how to handle, mm-hmm. and they didn't know then how to you know make that space for for me. Yeah, and the awareness is is the interesting thing. So, you you mentioned something earlier about your mum and dad, and your dad being a workaholic and all that sort of stuff. So, in a way, those sort of you see those traits in your environment, and like that's what. That's what I have to be like then, and then you you hit your burnout and you or you hit, you reach a point that you that you ended up getting to. What what made you choose the the line of work that you're that you're now in? Like was that was these all a mixture of a number of things like conversations with you or seeing how your grandmother was ill health or what what, what kind of. So made I think you that was that? probably like a backdrop. Mm. Uh, my mum had always been; she was lucky in the. At that time in England, she had, um, we still had health visitors. So after you had a baby, you would have like a nurse yeah, come yeah. to the house and, and, and so on, like a community nurse. And at that time, the, certainly the particular nurse that she had coming and going, when my sister, for instance, had long-term antibiotics for ear issues when she was very small, the nurse was like, you know, whilst we're giving her these antibiotics, we also need to make sure that we give her some of these vitamins because the antibiotics will actually, essentially, yeah, yeah, yeah. deplete those because they they crowd out the receptors that those vitamins would also be hooking up to. Um, And when we were kids, you know, my mom would give us different things in winter. And so she was very open to that. 
so I had that as you know my experience of medicine is not everything yeah, yeah. going to the doctor they are not god yeah and then being unwell myself I was always a little bit left of center in the sense that I've never necessarily accepted what an authority figure tells me uh, I agree I'm right? saying, I think I'm a saying. lot of us that are entrepreneurs yeah, yeah. are, you know, and... and you should naturally uh, second guess it. Yeah, you're like, like, well, hang on, you're telling me, me that, but opinion. I'm going to need to, you know... We'll go and look at this. Yeah, go myself. And, and see if that, that is a truth for me, because mm. truth, truth, you know, depends. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, I'd always been interested in, like, what would now be called, like, clean products, so not testing on animals. So I never bought makeup that was tested on animals when I was experimenting with makeup in my teens, mm -hmm. my toiletries, I as much as possible stayed away from stuff again that was tested on animals. I used to do things like collect um, uh, petitions, like signatures for um, against things that were still legal in the, in the UK, mm -hmm. things like, you know, fox hunting yeah, and badger yeah. baiting and, and stuff like that. So I was always really passionate about I guess the environment yeah. and just nature mm -hmm. really. And I just, I don't know. I don't think it was a conscious decision, but I was like, this can't be it. Mm -hmm. You know, at 21 years of age, every time I get some kind of pressure. So at that time it was my finals at, at uni. I can't spend my life wondering where a toilet is. Like mm -hmm. every time I feel a little bit nervous. I don't want to spend my life wondering if I should go on to an antidepressant. I did try them at a couple of different points and they just did not work for me. Mm. Now that I'm obviously much, much further on in my journey and I've seen my DNA of my mm -hmm. neurotransmitters, I know why those didn't work for, didn't you. Work for mm -hmm. me. But mm -hmm. no one could explain it at the time. And when you're in your early 20s, you do just want, most of us, even yeah. though I was, you know. To feel okay. Yeah. You just want, you just want someone to take it away, right? Mm-hmm. So I think it was a combination of things, Dale, but, but ultimately at some point I must have made a decision either subconsciously, I yeah. don't remember being a conscious decision, that I was not prepared for this to be my lot. To accept it. You're ready to take yeah. control and find out for yourself. Interesting. I think a lot of young women, in particular just from clients that we've coached and people that we know, are in and out of hospital trying to figure out what is what is wrong with whether it's... Um, cramps from the period pain or it's indigestion or whatever it is there's just so much but it's sad at this day and age that i feel that it it's like oh yeah that's that's just normal and we don't know what actual healthy normal looks like we speak we speak about this a lot with our coaching um that look we're gonna you think cutting calories and moving more is the answer to your your health and fitness goals but in reality you don't know what normal feels like because you've been so restrictive with the food that you eat for so long that when we get you eating more food wait till you see what life can actually be like and energy hair skin nails all this sort of thing so um so f i guess a, a follow-up question to that as you on the point of what is normal i heard that in one of your your other podcasts i think a lot of young women guys as well but more so women feel a wee bit shamed of eating the whole tin of biscuits rather than being curious, rather than really going, why? You know, I love why? that I know. So I heard that and I was like, that's a fantastic way of, of putting that across. And and I think this is something subconsciously that we've done in our coaching. So I said, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with the behavior, but it's understanding why is that the behavior, not, yeah, not yeah. the guilt associated with it because you never truly fix it. Yeah. So what, what have you found out for yourself along well, that, that I mean, sort of things? Well, I mean, firstly, curiosity and compassion if there, if if I had to, you know, if somebody said to me, well, you know, what are the key themes? Curiosity and compassion. Um, and the thing to understand from a biological perspective is that the body is always trying to let us know. Mm. Again, we haven't been educated to understand the symptoms that arise in the body, whether that is PMS, whether that is IBS, whether that is reflux, whether that is a headache, yeah. they are there to tell us something, but we are actively discouraged from being curious about our own bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, these are, they're fucking miracles. <laughs> like really, yeah, they, they are. So fascinating. What and what they put up with over the course of many people's lifetime is it's, it's spectacular that they don't fail earlier. Mm. But because we don't have that default position of curiosity, as you say, it's very easy to fall into 
to lapse into shame and guilt Mm -hmm. rather than going, okay, well, why do I feel like, you know, why do I feel like, you know, I've had three chocolates, but I feel like I just am compelled to keep going. Mm. And that's been a big part of my story as well as, you know, having had an eating disorder and, and actually more recently, as you've probably seen, having done another kind of deep dive in terms of reflecting on the paradigm that I live from and how I want to ensure that my actions in the world reflect that paradigm. Yeah, so yeah. hitting level 50 in January, going back to, it's not that I'm, I've been unhappy and, and this will interest you. And I know I'm kind of going off on no, a no, tangent. You'll bring me back. <laughs> no, that um, the, I, I recently posted in the last couple of days, a before and after picture. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And that, but in the before picture where I'm carrying a few extra inches around my middle, like there's no doubt about it. I wasn't unhappy. You can probably see I'm smiling, right? And I'm genuinely smiling. I'm yeah, not it's just, real. it's not a fix. It's a, it's a genuine smile. And part of it is a little bit, oh my God, I can't believe I'm taking pictures of this <laughs> to, to share with my coach. Like this is next level uncomfortable. Because right? I'm actually, although I'm, I, I am actually quite a, what's the word? I'm quite reserved in terms of, you know, my physical body. Like I'm at home, I'm quite happy to be naked, but I'm not someone who's ever going to want to be on a, a beach. Naked, oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm comfortable with my body. I recently uh, pitched to a newspaper and was asked to send those pictures over. I sent them over and I was told, essentially to cut a long story short, I was told that in the first picture, I looked too enthusiastic. Yeah. Because the a, underlying message was yeah. unhappy, that unhappy. I should be miserable because I was carrying a little bit of extra fat mm. around my abdomen. It's funny you mention that because we talk a lot in the show. We, we're not huge fans of before and after pictures for this reason because a lot of coaches in this space do some shady shit oh. to make that picture on the left yeah. look worse than what it yeah. actually is. And, and they then the other one the to look better. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or change yeah, yeah. the light. Make it, I, can make, so I can stand just now, I've done it in a, in a recent video, where I can make myself look miserable and then I can just change my posture and make a, myself look as if I've had this amazing transformation. And, and I just think to, to fixate so much on looks, it, it doesn't lead to this sort of holistic, healthy lifestyle yeah, yeah. that we, we should be chasing. Agreed. For me, it, it's been it's been helpful. I only do them every fortnight okay. for, for my particular yeah. coach. And it's been helpful in a way to kind of, because I am someone who is probably more on the, like less inclined to share vulnerable elements of myself, which from a social media perspective can be very helpful for people. When I shared those pictures on Facebook, people went nuts, like in a really positive way. They were like, this is so inspiring. And I was like, is it? Okay. And, and I think just that's feels the like the next th- step yeah. of my journey yeah, for yeah. me. It's, it's the hard thing because that, if it is, if it does inspire our person, then there's more people getting into health and fitness. But I think it can be, I think you're you a very self-aware person with um, triggers and knowing not to get, I guess, like for you to chase an aesthetic go, I, I can't imagine you'd be the person that's, that's going to, ruin the relationship with your kids oh. and your husband just to get abs Listen, for example i was talking to rob about this today right and even some people on social media that i you know i have personal relationships with and i have a great deal of respect and mm. love for when you see some of their behaviors people that are in the health and fitness transformation space mm-hmm. They are perpetuating the same issues that these people, this this editor in this newspaper was perpetuating. The journalist was mortified. She was really embarrassed. That's why she phoned me and wouldn't write it in an email. <laughs> but, you know, you what you can see is you see these behaviors where someone goes on holiday and they let it rip, in inverted commas, so they eat and drink with impunity. Then they come back and they have to do a mini cut. <laughs> or, right, they starve themselves in preparation for a photo shoot and paint themselves orange <sighs> and then have a biscuit this big ready yeah. to gorge at the end of it. I'm like, preach, you, preach. Oh, I know, I know you're just <laughs> right. I this mean, is that. You, you're out there saying that you're a positive role model, mm. but you are actually like, how, where's your mentor? Where's your coach calling mm. you in on your bullshit? Because we all have bullshit, we all have we blind do, spots. We do, we uh, do, yeah, 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 you're yeah, absolutely yeah, right. Absolutely. So, um, so m- moving. I'm trying to even think where we where we were. Oh, sorry, sorry, moving, moving on from that. 
<laughs> like, cause I could sit here all day and talk I about talk, I, We could talk about that kind of stuff Gavin, all day. Yeah, Gavin, yeah. who's in there, he's got his own podcast and he had me on yesterday and we were talking about this subject. So I'm, I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And it's probably why we have a, a podcast like this because yeah. you can explain like there's nothing not that there's anything necessarily wrong with people taking before and after it's, it's how it's, it's marketed it's how from us as coaches yeah. and for me it's not about that. weight loss oh, yeah, it yeah. wasn't about weight loss Good. it was about building strength mm, it's about it. me showing up in a way that well to go back to your point about you know like hormones and so mm. on it's about not having shame and guilt around how you feel and what you're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And then it's about also understanding that radical responsibility can coexist with compassion. Mm -hmm. And we get to decide if we listen to those messages with curiosity and go back to the three, you know, sweets, chocolates. What I've learned about myself that's been very, very helpful has been from the from a you know nutrigenomic perspective, so looking at genetic variants and how that influences our nutritional needs and how our nutritional needs then influence our genetic variants, is that I have a couple of things that make me more inclined to want to eat. So firstly, I have what's called the Labrador gene. Mm -hmm. So POMC is the Labrador gene. gene. It's called the Labrador gene because it was originally found in Labradors. Right. Right. I'll go lab. Maybe right. I've got there it. You go. <laughs> right. But I do you have definitely that. have it. Too. Because what it means is, and this is all evidence-based, right. that you are going to have a higher interest in food. And with that higher interest in food, also it tends to be foods that are you know, more flavorsome. Highly and palatable. we know that yeah. exactly the higher palatable foods are the ones that are more dense in nutrients, mm -hmm. uh, in, in calories, yeah. right? In energy. I took one of through from the Halloween party and I was like, I could eat five of them. Uh, right, so here's the on? thing. Yeah. So and this yeah. is what I'm saying about understanding, uh, look, approaching things are. with curiosity. For me, so I've got that. The other thing I've got is a down regulation on my leptin receptors, mm -hmm. right? So you guys know leptin mm -hmm. is to do with satiety, with feeling satisfied. Yeah, so what happens is firstly, I'm here for the food. Like <laughs> I am all about the food. I'm a foodie. I love food. And you get nothing And once I food. start <laughs> eating, there's no off switch. Yeah, yeah. So I have to be very, very self-aware. And that's not to say like, so when I was in Manchester a few weeks ago, I let my inner Labrador out mm -hmm. to play yeah. because I need to sometimes. Mm -hmm. What I don't do is gorge like I used to, to a point where I then want to, to make myself vomit, which I could mm -hmm. never do. So I chose anorexia instead. Like, you know, <laughs> um, thankfully I never went too far down that route yeah. and I'm not minimizing it because as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm just not. But what I'm saying is that uh, having that, additional understanding of myself allowed me to realize that this is a biological phenomenon. Yeah. It's not something that I'm just like choosing. I am having to, or I'm ch I, what I'm choosing to do is to intentionally decide whether or not I want to work with that mm. or let it control me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is the stuff that truly fascinates me when it comes to behavioral stuff, but also why I wanted to get you on the show because you talk about like your biological blueprint and all this sort of stuff. So on that, on what you found out for yourself, do you think that can be enhanced through childhood behavioral stuff? Or do you think if you have this gene, for example, it's, is there, is there levels to it? Like I could be operating at a level 10 because You've been I was told no now. when I, I couldn't have snacks when I was yeah. younger, so I started sneaking about. Yeah. Now I'm a, an adult and I'm still, do you think yeah. that yeah. has a part to play 100%. as well? 100%. Yeah. So these, none of these genes that I'm talking about are fatalistic. Mm. You know, what they will do is intersect with other genes, which will then amplify one another. So right. if you look at AMPK and mTOR, mm. um, again, I don't want to get too technical, but right. mTOR is about building, right? Mm. It's about eating building the body, um, trying to get full. And that is something that's very, very helpful in the first part of our lives. So it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but exactly as you say, if you've had a childhood experience where someone around you has got guilt and shame around food and is worried that, you know, essentially you're gonna end up with a dysfunctional relationship with food and, and get become obese, for instance, mm. which could be a valid concern yeah. because we know that doesn't come with great health outcomes then that's going to add another layer on the epigenetic side yeah. and compound what's laying there in your blueprint. Mm -hmm. Whereas 
um, you know, if you've had people around you who are very relaxed with food, who have modeled, you know, healthy eating behaviors, then you're less likely for those genetics to switch on earlier on, yeah. as in switch on, as in become, you know, express themselves in the most unhelpful ways yeah. earlier on in your life. Yeah, got you, got you. So talking about the biological blueprint, that was a, was that a term you came up with within your framework that you do now? Or was that just, was that just something you'd kind of came across you did you not that you came up with it i guess but you applied that framework and it became more of a structure towards your yeah i mean style. i i think of the the nutrigenomic aspect of things as a blueprint because it's like a road map mm -hmm. and with any journey you know just because you've got a map it doesn't mean that you're going to go with that exact route mm -hmm. so that's why i describe it like that the the blueprint from the this genetic you know um uh, way that i work with with my clients is part of allowing somebody the opportunity to broaden and maximize their biological bandwidth. Mm -hmm. And that's like a SWOT analysis. So we've all got biological strengths that we're not necessarily aware of we're leaning into. Mm. But again, high performers tend to have some specific patterns that mean that they can keep going above and beyond, but that sometimes they are compelled to keep going and they don't know how to switch off. Yeah. And we also all have biological weaknesses or more vulnerable areas where because of our genetic variants, we might need more of specific key nutrients. And if we don't know that and we don't then give our body those um, particular nutrients, we're going to insidiously and unconsciously drain and deplete ourselves. Right. And that's where, for me, like even in the last couple of years, one of the things I learned from nutrigenomic testing for myself was about my need for a particular form of B12. Yeah, I heard, I heard you speak about this. And this is it's a fantastic point to bring up because it's, most people will go down. I actually come across some clients as, and family members. It's like, yeah, I need to need to get some some vitamins. Here's a multivitamin from Boots. I'll just take that. That does the trick. And it's mm -hmm. like, your body size, how you digest your food. I don't think we've truly realized the chemical processes that goes into our body to break something down. And it can be so complex to each person. Yeah, I it? mean, in, in, in the simplest of terms, firstly, you've got to have the raw ingredients going into the body, right? So whether that comes from food or whether that comes from a judicious use of an appropriate supplement. So that's the first thing, you'll have the raw ingredient. Mm. Second thing is, it's got to be absorbed. Mm. And it's got to be transported. And it's got to hook up to the receptors and be used. Mm. So there are various stages at which things can go a little bit awry. Mm. So for instance, with me and, and B12, I had suspected again for a period of time that I had a B12 deficiency. And this came about, I think, because in 2019, when I finished my master's degree and we had also completed our family through adoption the year before, mm. I was maxed out. Like I had, I had been working, you know, firstly, you know, in an employed role, trying to do a master's degree. So coming home from work at that stage, we just had our eldest son, spending time with him, having dinner, he'd go to bed. And then I'd be trying to hit the books for three, four hours, reading like really intensive research papers. And like I say, I'm not an academic person. Yeah. So it took a lot. Mm. And then, as I say, our youngest was who was introduced through um, the adoption process um, the following year. So I was really like from a cognitive perspective, I really had said to Rob a few times, it's my husband, um, I just I just haven't got the bandwidth cognitively. I just I just haven't got it anymore. Like, I don't though. know where it's mm -hmm. gone. Right. Yeah, I know. But the, but the thing is, I was, I'm like, where's the I'm solution? Resilient. Yeah, yeah. Where's the solution? Me. So given the. I got, I stayed curious. I was always curious, but I got curious and I was like, you know, this really correlates with a B12 issue. So I got tested and my B12, fine. fine. I know, right? I know that, that, again, certain things need to be tested in certain ways. Every testing way of testing has we'll constraints and needs days. to be put in context. Yeah. How are you so testing? Like, what did you do for your blood work? Just the blood, blood work, yeah, okay. at that stage. So mm. I think it's I think it's actually serum, isn't it? They do B12. Mm. But the point is that it is well known to be a fairly inconclusive test. So I wasn't, I was just like, I'll go and check. So you can check, I think it's methylmalonic acid or something else as well. And I was just like, it, just nothing was showing. 
And it wasn't until I did this particular, so I did a methylation profile. This will take us nicely on to Gary Brecker. Oh, nice, huh? nice. <laughs> um, it wasn't until I did the methylation profile and I saw that my genotype for uh, B12 was potentially reduced absorption, reduced transportation. If for B12, there's actually a recycling that needs to happen, uh, reduced capacity to recycle. Right. And then also an additional need for a particular form of B12, which is called a denazole B12, which you don't get in any of the JAGs or anything like that. I was going to mention the JAGs right? there. So, so anyway, I'm like, I think this is it. Now, there's very few times, I, there's very few times in my, you know, professional life where I'm like, it's this one thing. Usually it's not just one thing. Mm -hmm. I took, I kid you not, I took the first dose of that adenosyl B12 and it was like something lit up in my brain that had not been on for a number of years. I could wow. not believe it. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that everyone will get of that, course, yeah. you know, because maybe <clears throat> someone else isn't as depleted as I had depleted myself because yeah, yeah. I've been hitting my cognitive bandwidth so you know, much, an, an so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, more so, more so than your your average person anyway, and in, in many different ways, of yeah. course. Of and uh, vitamin, just just so just to give you another example, vitamin D is a really good example. Um, if you have a down regulation on the sensitivity of your vitamin D receptors, then when you are supplementing vitamin D, obviously it has to be vitamin D three. But when you are supplementing, you need to make sure that you go above what would consider to be the normal acceptable range. And you need to be up at something like, I think it's 100 nanomol nanomoles per milliliter. Um, whereas usually 80 to 100 would be considered normal. Yeah. But if your receptors aren't as receptive, you need to have more of that vitamin D there to almost like, it's like putting pressure on a doorman. Yeah, there's like, more of us here. You are going to let us in. It's right, like a, right, it's right. Like, so the way the way I heard it again communicating, I thought it was fantastic. It's like a plane trying to land on a runway, and there's tons of turbulence. It needs to punch through the the wind. And it's funny you say that. So I got my blood work done years ago. And I was taking vitamin D D three. I was looking at the back, and it said, I think it was like three thousand or eight thousand IU. And it was a lot. Of, it was a lot of the wee pills that it was taking and this was in my bodybuilding day so i had fish oil i had so many i felt like bloody junkie <laughs> i was like i'm full from eating this many bloody nutrients and uh, a multivitamin sorry and i got my blood work done and i was deficient in it still i was like how on earth am i deficient so that, that explains i think a lot of people do do face that and to of your course. point about people buying supplements from the supermarket mm. you get what you pay mm. for if you look at a standard supplement in um you know, uh, the supermarket or even your kind of run-of-the-mill chemist on the high street, there's no regulation about the oh, types of the yeah. nutrients that can go in. Yeah. And so people could, when, when you know, people will sometimes say, oh, it's like making expensive urine. Yeah, it is. It, it actually is for some of those, like, really just, you know, Oh, that one's two pound, that one's nine pound type of thing, yeah. Yeah, and people go, oh, well, that's the cheapest one. But actually, you know, you look at vitamin E is a really common one that they put a DL form instead of the D-alpha to cover all. The body doesn't recognize that form. Yeah, right, right. So it's almost just fancy. It's pointless. It's, <laughs> it's you're saying, just, it is. You're, you're just, pishing your money up a wall. BCAAs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, is hopefully that, you're doing it down the toilet. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I try, I try. So I wanted to talk about supplements. So while we're on the subject then, um, so you're going through your journey of B12 uh, with a very good understanding of what's going on biologically. And if you think, well, the, the, even for someone like me and James who are in the health and fitness space, what's some of the telltale signs that you would, or what is what is a strategy when you're kind of working with clients? Um, you mentioned the car earlier, and this is a point we brought up before that we get MLTs in our car every year, yet we never do our own blood panel or our own blood work. Mm -hmm. And something I like that I've done is I've got snapshots at the age of 24. Should have done it every year, but it's something I'm doing on a, on a yearly basis yeah. where I can see what's necessarily changed in my life that's caused a spike in, in my blood panel. So are you, are you for that type of, like, getting your bloods done or is the different types of testing that yeah. you think people should do? What, it, I mean, it, it does that? depend a little. I need a t-shirt that says it depends. I actually it's do have best. one. I should Which have worn good. it. Yeah. It's, right? it's supposed to be like that. No. Uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, a good coach if that, that's There's the answer nuance, you go right? with it. These yeah. blanket statements of these are the only tests you'll ever need. It's, it's nonsense. Mm. It's, um, but I definitely advocate for people to build up a, an understanding and some data if it's, if they've got the resources to be able to do it. Course, because yeah. 
during COVID, my blood pressure went up and I knew it had gone up because I've tracked it. Yeah, I know yeah, what yeah. my blood pressure was in my 20s versus my 30s and, and so on. And it's, it's still pretty much around the same. But I knew it had gone up because I could feel it. And when I went to the doctor and got it checked, because it was within normal, the normal parameters, not that I would have wanted medication. I just wanted to just, you know, make sure that taking it at home is sometimes different to getting obviously a professional to do it. Um, I, I could see that it had elevated, even though it was still within normal. And this is the thing about early intervention. If you've got an understanding, as, as you're saying, Dale, of what that looks like in your 20s and every year into your 30s and so on, then you can intervene earlier because you can see if your blood pressure has gone up five points. Mm -hmm. Or um, as you say, it might be a situationally specific thing and, and six months later it's back down again and, and, and that can be fine. So I really advocate for people... You know, most people who come to me have never even asked their doctor for a copy of their results. And I'm like, you are the advocate. You you are the custodian of your own health, mm. you know, and, and at any point you might want to take that information and bring it to me or give it to somebody else down the track. Mm. Build that, you know, build that data bank for yourself. Yeah. Um, so yes to blood tests, as long as we understand the constraints, mm. because I gave you a couple of examples from mm. a thyroid B12 perspective. Yeah. Um, and when I talk about blood tests, I'm talking about serum and, you know, all anything that they do essentially with a blood draw within yeah. a, the, you know, the medical paradigm. Is there a difference with the pricking on your finger? I know it's not, it I know straight from the vein is obviously the, the best way to go about it. And I changed that up with the most recent blood test I've done uh, just over a year ago, actually now. Um, and pricking your finger I couldn't get any blood out of my hands in yeah. the morning because I was so yeah. dehydrated yeah. and stuff like that <laughs> it, was, uh, it, it wasn't helping so so um, blood work is there any other types of tests for understanding more biologically then yeah so from a gut perspective um, a stool test within the medical paradigm again is looking for organisms that are known to create some kind of you know, hideous, unrelenting diarrhea, like um, there's a particular form of um, uh, E. coli. But there are other strains of E. coli that are actually quite can be quite helpful in the body. Yeah, I'd, Clostridium I had to get, had to get the first stool test this year. Yeah, C. I was like, what's a stool test? <laughs> yeah, but that, again, that's about ruling out um, pathogens. Yeah. A functional stool test, and I work with the uh, gold standard of gut testing globally because we're fortunate enough that here in the UK we have that laboratory. We get to see not just some of the things that are not overtly pathogenic but could be potentially pathogenic, who are opportunistic, so who have taken up residence because perhaps the beneficial strains of bacteria are not in situ because they've been perhaps obliterated by a previous course of antibiotics, for instance. Mm -hmm. But we also get to see things like um, uh, some digestive markers such as uh, pancreatic enzymes, which is a good broad spectrum marker of, of you know, how we're able to um, break our food down in the stomach. And then some immune markers like uh, for inflammation. Mm. So it's a much broader um, way of not just looking at, as I say, specific strains that definitely cause a medical emergency, but actually seeing what's in there. It's almost like looking at a suburb in the sense of when you drive around a suburb, you know, you can see that there are some elements of the suburb that maybe are a little bit less you know, the, the houses aren't quite as well looked after. Yeah. Maybe the buildings are in a little bit of, of disrepair. Mm -hmm. But there are other parts of the suburb that you can see people are taking care of their properties. There's good amenities and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so yeah, on, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's flourishing. Uh, right, exactly. It's about understanding as well that it's not always about what is there that's problematic. Sometimes it's about what isn't there. Mm. Yeah. In terms of the beneficial strains. Yeah. So stool analysis is something that I've worked with for the 20 years I've been in practice. Also, you know, there can be some women watching, right? Of course, yeah. Profiling majority, the yeah. vaginal microbiome, mm -hmm. which again is not talked about enough because it's not something that is looked at within the medical system. Right. But for some women, 
when it comes to things like fertility outcomes, when it comes to things like certain organisms that are, you know, um, unpleasant and have overtaken the vaginal tract, Mm -hmm. getting a better understanding of why those might be proliferating because some of the beneficial bacteria might not be in situ. Mm -hmm. Is, a, is another thing that is not yeah, available. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, if you go to the, the doctors and you've got like an unrelenting thrush, which which is something a lot of women suffer with, mm. and if they do a blood test or whatever, that's not, not really going to yeah. do anything. That's yeah. why I've asked you. a swab. Yeah, that's why I was asking you the question. I think we think, oh, I'll get my bloods done. It's like your blood test. Yeah, it's the big small, right? small yeah. minority. One minority. part of this big kind of yeah. um and, complex and then, puzzle. you know, uh, over my years, I've done salivary testing for, you know, saliva can be a good way to test stress hormones, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, some urinary testing for different things. A huge part of my work now is the DNA. Mm-hmm. So that is that's the blueprint mm-hmm. in the sense of that won't change. But what we are looking at is where are the opportunities to firstly understand so get curious about what is and isn't in that blueprint and then taking that information and and using it to inform as i said that SWOT analysis Mm -hmm. so that you know where your opportunities are to ensure that those um less helpful exactly less helpful elements are not kind of intersecting and gathering pace to then leave us in a situation where we find we're you know gorging on yeah. chocolate and just can't stop eating yeah so i was going to ask you what's, what's some real world examples of that so like someone like well, we've we've mentioned earlier like not just having one bit of chocolate the need for for others so well i guess actually back to the the supplementation side of things what's your view on supplements then in the space so obviously there's a lot of rubbish out there it's very unregulated mm-hmm. we've done a pretty at length episode <laughs> on it as well and um, we are we have, we're we have. not big advocates of it but it's definitely it definitely has its value yeah. And and it's hard because you can't blanket statement everything, but from the people that you've worked with and what you've seen through various different testing, is there any like you know what go to supplements that you would that you would that your mind kind of? So most people are going to have some kind of glitch in methylation. Okay. So for the purposes of this conversation, and this is how I explain it to my one to one clients, methylation is essentially five games of biological past the parcel. That's what I call it. Where this thing called a methyl group, which is just simply a collection of carbon and three hydrogen atoms, gets passed around these five different cycles. And as, I don't know if you guys played past the parcel as kids. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you remember there was always somebody (laughs) who wanted to hold on to the parcel and not give it away. Mm -hmm. Or, um, uh, you know, they, they wanted to, you know, have more turns and, and so on. So in these past in in these games, you've got situations whereby these little glitches impede the methyl the, the methyl group from being passed around. And in each of those games, there are key players. And those key players are nutrients. Yeah. Okay. So to hedge our bets, if we don't have that information, a broad spectrum, not high dose, because if you overmethylate, that's problematic as well, but a low dose, good quality uh, B vitamin supplement that has the methyl forms of Bs. And if you go into a good health food store, and I'm not talking about the one that rhymes with Bolland and Sharrett. I was just about to ask the clip. What, 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 would you, what would you consider a good health store? <laughs> so it's the radio. We can, we can go yeah, straight Yeah, do, do whatever you want. Um, you know, but I'm, again, I'm an advocate of supporting small business. So no, find yourself yeah, yeah. like an independent health yeah. food store if there is one in your town. See, see on that then, talking about getting it from natural foods, because I think we always overlook that. And, and this is where we start to piece together that food, yes, has a taste element to it but also ha- it feeds us for our performance and we forget that so what what would be the go-to foods that, that help so with that? again there's a huge number of foods that are involved or provide the well, nutrients involved, of course, but, yeah. but when we if you look at the start of methylation mm-hmm. it's called the folate cycle so again this is where it gets really confusing for people no wonder it's so hard yeah. out there right because folate which is found in Leafy greens, right? Leafy greens is a huge, hugely rich source of folate. It's also known as B9, but it's also known in the supplement world as folic acid. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is that some people shouldn't go anywhere near folic acid because of what happens in their genetic variants in their methylation cycle. So what I always say is, 
Absolutely, 100%. Always check your supplements for folic acid. Unless you've done a methylation DNA profiling with someone like me, do not touch folic acid. Because if you've got a genetic polymorphism that is problematic with folic acid, you could be eating loads and loads of folate, um, but the folic acid could be a kind of create an obstacle. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are some people that actually do really well with folic acid yeah. and they don't do as well with folate. But generally speaking, if we're talking about food, you know, making sure you're not drinking alcohol on a regular basis with your green leafy vegetables, because that will impede the, you know, assimilation mm. of the, the folate actually getting into your body and then combining it with, and I know this is probably going to be, you know, it's ridiculous that this is even potentially contentious, that we do need some animal products. If we're talking about, hey. right? if we're talking about things like B12, for yeah, instance, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I was, interestingly, I was, I, I always wanted to be a vegan. Yeah. Well, of right? course, your, your, your whole I wanted to be a vegan. I failed nature. spectacularly at veganism mm. because after a very short period of time, and I did it in my early 20s, <laughs> I just noticed such a downturn in my brain health. Yeah. Uh, my uh, And when I say brain health, I mean my eyes, because yeah. your eyes are part of our brain, right? They're just a specialized part of it. Um, and that is probably, again, as an aside, because I have a SNP in a genetic polymorphism, which reduces my ability to convert the vitamin A sources from the plant foods mm -hmm. into retinol. Right. right. So if you are a vegan and you have those SNPs and you actually don't do well converting into active retinol, you could be screwing over your immune system, your eyes, your thyroid health, the lining of your gut. Everything. Yeah. So much. So this is the thing, these, bla these blanket statements around this particular diet is the best. This, all this nutritional like diet dogma. Yeah. It's again, it's 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 really problematic. Of course, and I think this is where we we all fall into camps, and it's the worst thing about camps because, like you said, it depends is a very common answer to a lot of people, and some people will work really well on eliminating meat from the diet, and then they are almost held up on this pedestal because they have this fantastic life, and we're then comparing our our life when we don't know our our. Well, I guess you'll know more of this, like your your biological data or your DNA. You could never fall into that category of that individual. Well, and and I mean, obviously the latest one is the carnival diet, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and massive. I'm not here for that either because yeah, yeah. the thing is, I absolutely understand why someone who perhaps has got some underlying gut issues would and could feel better on a carnivorous diet because you are mo removing fiber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> fiber is, what we used to call it roughage. It is rough on the lining of the gut. So if you've got a digestive tract that is a bit irritated, like almost having an internal sunburn, and you remove that, your lining is going to go, oh, mate, thanks. It's like putting <laughs> aloe vera on a, you know, a burn when you've got sunburn. And you're going to feel better in the short, yeah. short term. However... If you've got some genes that mean that you are more predisposed to um, holding, not taking fat over into the mitochondria, holding it in your circulation for longer, for instance, if you do that carnivorous diet for a long enough period of time, you could increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one thing that is going about it. That's the biggest thing that right? the people have the problem so, with. So I'm not saying that a carnivorous diet could help someone in a transitional phase to, to remove plant material for a short period of time. But also, if you go back, I always go back to the evidence. What does the research say? Mm -hmm. And the, there's, the one commonality that goes through all the research at this point is eat food, as in real food, mostly plants. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to that, doesn't it? Which is interesting. And it, it, so going on between the relationship <clears throat> between your gut and your brain and that sort of thing, because we all, I think I heard something a while back, which was we know more about our brain in the universe than we do about our gut. And I think in the next five, 10 years, for sure, we've had these sort of big paradigm shift moments in the medical space and with technology. I think one of the next ones we're going to see is the more information comes out of what happens in our gut and how that can affect how we feel uh, from anxiety to depression and all that sort of stuff. What is your take on the feelings in your gut? Because a lot of people are trying to work out um, inflammation or try to work out the foods that they're eating and they don't really piece together the part that 
the takeaway that they have on a Friday night is is got part and parcel to play with the hangover they have on Sunday morning and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, like we were saying about the the journey with nutrients, you know, that there's uh, several stages in the process. I think what tends to happen in gut issues is that, and also here in the UK, obviously everyone is terrible about talking about poo, right? Like, oh, yeah. So what's the fear of God like into people? It's almost like as soon as you mention the word poo, especially if it's a bloke, they run to a wall and stick their bum against the wall. Like you know, as if even the mere mention is is problematic. So the uh, like it's you know aspersion on their sexuality or something. So um the 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 thing is that because so many people have a an issue with their poo and like from their from their perspective it's their large intestine that's the problem yeah yeah what's overlooked is the fact that that's the end result of these different stages of a process at which point there could be you know various things happening so for instance people will be like oh i'm so bloated you know i'm so bloated i'm so bloated i must need a probiotic and then they take a probiotic oh, yeah. and they're like even more bloated or they try to eat more prebiotic foods and they're like, oh my God, I've blown up and now I look about eight months pregnant. And that's because potentially the problem that they're experiencing that to them is in their bowel is actually starting higher up in the tract. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it could have started even before we've got into the stomach because we've got the cephalic phase of digestion, which is before we eat. And the cephalic phase of digestion is arguably the phase of digestion that in 21st century life is most overlooked. Is that the but chewing part? Well, no, it's is, before is, is that. It before so that, it's right, the okay. it's the almost the um, the anticipation, right? right okay. It's the, I'm in the kitchen, I'm chopping up my food. I'm smelling all the things. I'm with my food, ah, James. Yeah, yeah. You've you got your nut <laughs> dry yeah, food, yeah. and you're like, well, oh my that. goodness. Yeah, right. Smell it. <laughs> but you know, the, the, the reality is again, that we have got certain processes in our body that if we don't engage with them, they will cause them these subsequent processes to under function. It's like missing out a step on a supply chain, so, missing out one of the processes. So, ages, I should say. So what do you mean by like that with having a, a line, because, outline so it, that's your brain going oh man i'm you know i'm looking at the food i'm anticipating the taste of the food i'm smelling the food as you're making it and what that's doing is through the olfactory system that is switching on the nerves to the stomach right and and getting you salivating and actually preparing all the enzymes and the hydrochloric acid right. in preparation for the food to come into the stomach. And then you've mentioned chewing, Dale, which is a great point because then most people are under chewing. I'm one of the guys. Right? Yeah. Two chomps. I'm know, probably under yeah. chewing as well. Yeah. I need to chill. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, why can't I do a shit? <laughs> or why is my shit like, why does it you know, why is it smearing all over the toilet? <laughs> yeah. right. And I'm having to like, you know, buy extra cleaning agent to get down there. With <laughs> <laughs> so uh, stools in it, it's a funny one because it's, it's one of the points here I'd love your take on. And I don't think, I'm not sure how many coaches can I go into this level of data, but workouts is obviously a big part and driver of our training, lifting weights. We're big advocates of people lifting compound movements, getting building resilience in their joints, their muscles, tendons, ligaments, all this sort of stuff. Out with the gym, you have nutritional components. Uh, you have water intake, sleep. But we measure what we call biofeedback with clients. So um, digestion is one part of it, stress, mood, um, sex drive. I'm missing one. Sleep. Well, I mentioned right, sleep there. Right. So they, they're normally the five kind of pillars of biological feedback mm -hmm. that we call it that we look for and yeah. and people to be aware of because all they as they start tracking that if you ask me how was my sleep last night i'm like yeah it was okay but if you keep asking me that question i can yeah, go actually that was definitely different to tuesday nights yeah, and yeah, tuesday yeah. nights was different to yeah, monday self -awareness, right? yeah so uh, on that front what some things that that can affect all of that in in your field that you see the biggest improvements on I'm not sure if I understood the question, but what I wanted to say to you guys is that, and I'm sure you're on this based on what you've told me um, just then, is that one of the key things I see if I've got a client that's working with a fitness coach that isn't kind of necessarily directly associated with me mm -hmm. in that they know my methodologies, I know their methodologies, so often it's, it's Rob, right? Mm -hmm. um, but 
If you're wanting a client to get up to, say, 1.5, 2 grams of protein per kilo of body weight, for instance, and they are bloating and, you know, finding mm. that they're stinking and it's having an effect on their sex drive yeah, and yeah, you know, stuff yeah. like that. If a coach, and I talked about this actually on on, um, uh, on Instagram uh, in a conversation, if, you're, if you go back to your coach and you say, listen, this is what's happening, or you don't feel safe to share that with your coach, if you A, don't share it, then obviously the coach can't adjust it. But if you share it and the coach is just like, well, mate, that's how much protein you've got to eat, so you just have uh, to get on with it. Coach. Brutal. Then, get a new coach. You know, that makes somebody feel like they're failing, right? Yeah. And also, it might just be like, oh, mate, yeah, we all stink like that. Because maybe that's been no. the coach's oh. experience. I said to him, actually, not too long ago, is, is your farts should not smell that bad. <laughs> I don't know why we think, oh, it's just a protein guy. It's just a protein powder. This was me as right. well. And I'm actually, so I'm, I'm eating for performance <laughs> in the gym. More than health right now. Louise will challenge yeah. us, well, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> I guess it depends a little bit on our definition of performance, doesn't it? Strength, that's um, it. That's it. It's on the uh, focus. Yeah, so... If we're talking about human optimization, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I would yeah. suggest that you might want to gift him some digestive enzymes <laughs> for Christmas. Yeah. Or, or earlier, if it's that bad. Bloody, yeah, well, that's that it, that chewing, but that's what well. I'm saying. If we're not, if and this is where things like protein shakes, for mm. instance, can be problematic because yeah, you know, we're designed that. to, but you know, for clients who maybe yeah, are yeah. using protein shakes as a supplement, mm. because we're not chewing, we're not tearing it up we're not getting the same signaling to the stomach because mm. chewing buys us time. Again, it's another way of switching the stomach on and saying, Something's hey, coming. get ready, something is coming. Yeah, right, right, right. I've it, actually, it, it I've actually thought that for a wee while. Like, cause I, <clears throat> I stopped taking protein shakes but before COVID. Yeah. When I went back to the gym, I was like, I'm not taking anything like that ever again. No shakes, only whole food. Felt so much different. And I can never explain it to people because it was only my experience. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I kind of go, you did this because I felt good. You can try this because I felt good, but it's no because I felt good. You're going to feel good. Do you so, know that way? But yeah, I can yeah. never actually say uh, this is why. It and felt we understand good. why people use them, right? Because it's perceived convenient. Convenient. But that. we also know when you're a little bit further on your journey, and you've got you don't need like so. I don't meal prep at the on a Sunday and meal prep for the week. I know some people do. As long as I know what I'm doing and I batch cook you know, a few things on Sunday just strategically and stay kind of one day ahead of myself in terms of knowing what's coming next. I'm, I'm good and I don't, I'm yeah, not yeah. using protein shakes. Anymore. Yeah, no, so no, you've no. worked out a, a, a format and structure yeah. for your lifestyle. Yeah, and that's, and that's it, about that's context, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. But I'm not course. sure that answered your question. Uh, no, so going back on the, <laughs> on the <laughs> question. To be fair, I wasn't too no, sure. Going, so going back on the question, we've got all these kind of biofeedbacks that we yeah. looked at. Um, see, on the digestion front, how important would you say that is, that is that one feedback? Because, we start working with clients and it's only awkward if you make it, but it's like, why are you interested in my poo? And it's like, well, if I, you answer me and you say, oh, I'm not pooed today, I'm not pooed the next day. And you're like, hang on a sec. Like, right, how happening? often do you, does your bills regularly move? I don't think, I think it's one of the last things people would even consider as part as their, of their health and fitness And how journey. often should your bills? Yeah, so how yeah, often yeah. should it? And okay, what sort I'm here of, for this conversation. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> and what sort of impact does that have on to everything when it comes to your health? Yeah, so um, let's start with how often you should poo. We're eating, most of us are eating a good three meals a day, right? Mm. Some of us like to eat four times a day. Um, so some seven. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's another conversation. Um, but you know, essentially, what goes in should be coming out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as a bare minimum, and this is a sweeping statement, yeah. but generally speaking, I'm very happy if people are having two good quality poos a day. As long as I'm not talking about one really good quality poo and then the second one is I'm shitting myself, you know, on the way to the toilet because yeah. it's so urgent and hurried. Yeah, yeah. But two good stools, two good bowel motions a day is 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 probably, you know, verging on optimal if you like. Okay. And easy, now the reason easy. for that. <laughs> <laughs> now the reason but there's a quality that, of yeah, the poos quality. That's coming my, out as well. Listen, my people first say in the morning is amazing. Oh, listen, it's supposed to make you feel good. So I again my one-to-one -one clients, I say to them, listen, it's supposed to feel like your family dog. And they're like, what do you mean? But you know in the morning, when your dog goes out, you let your dog out, they go out into the garden and 
and this is like a, 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 <laughs> my a, dog, right? And he's dog. so chuffed, right? Yeah. And he's scratching, and <laughs> woo, look what I did. Because actually, it, it, people don't talk about oh. this, but it's an endorphin release. Mm. It's supposed to Makes be part sense. of something that you know because we need to do it. Of course, yeah. So the designer made it something that should feel good, right? right? right. So if it doesn't feel good, if you're straining and pushing, and it's hard work then things get curious things need to change it could be as simple as not enough water right mm -hmm. so see with that then is, is water and fiber how important is that to to that because i've heard you talk about fiber and I, when i'm looking at nutrition logs for example fiber intake is probably as you low as it. yeah is it, it's probably low with with clients it's as low as eight grams with quite a lot of people so mm -hmm. protein is always lower with and it's a standard coach approach to go right we obviously we need to work protein on increasing fast. protein um through that process of increasing protein is it smart to increase your fiber intake along with that or yes. is that more important than the protein would you say i mean if we're talking about purely strength building then obviously protein is king or yeah 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 if we're talking about looking at things in a more 360 degree view, Energy. which I know you yeah, guys yeah, are, yeah, yeah. Um, then yeah, I definitely think fiber is is um, hugely overlooked by a lot of people in the fitness mm. space. Yeah. Um, but it also isn't the be all and end all, and I'll tell you why. Because okay. I've worked with the gut for 20 years, yeah. and also I don't know if you've seen this because I don't always talk about it, but I was a colon hydrotherapist okay. as part of my naturopathic training because the the practitioner that I was mentored by in my oh, yeah, latter yeah, stages, yeah, yeah. she was a colon hydrotherapist. She taught me and then I went on and did qualifications. So I've done thousands of colon hydrotherapy treatments. Right. And sometimes people are genuinely doing all the right things, but what they need is some re-education of the muscles of the bowel. Right. And you can't get that unless or until you have some water going in under very gentle pressure to actually stimulate the muscles right, okay. and to kind of wake them up because that sends biofeedback then to the brain of the gut, mm -hmm. which in chronic intractable constipation are always under functioning. It's just that they can't be tested because you would have to cut through the bowel to get to the nerves and no ethics committee is no. ever going to allow no. that. Yeah, yeah. But having worked with people who've been told, if you don't get my bowel, no pressure, right? If you don't get my bowel working, then I've been told I'm going to have to have a part of it removed. And oh. never without fail have we got somebody's bowel working. So this is going to be a bit of a, more of a selfish question only because my, my brother is actually going through a, a, a crazy back and forth with NHS just now. Um, and when you when you piece this together, I'm, I'm sure he won't mind me sharing and picking your brains around this. But if not, you'll have to edit it out. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nah, he spoke about it already. Late. He's getting good now. He's told me already. But he's been regularly bleeding for years, right? Back and forth. So he's had biopsies done, various parts of his intestines. He's been back and forth. They've even sent him to, and apologies, my vocabulary when it comes to various yeah. different practices and that, but something to do with his mouth. Mm -hmm. And this is someone who would fall into would I would say would fall into the morbidly obese category and I've been working with him okay. and his foods his food's good and he, he regularly trains and and I feel like he gets written off every time you see someone because they take one look at him and they're like mm, you just need to lose a wee bit of weight and it's like he's kind of forcing the GP's hand and everyone's hand so when it comes to the gut and I appreciate this is very complex and it could mm. be various mm -hmm. different things but as he's going through that process, like from the line of work that you've done, what would we have to do over here to get to, was this in Australia you were doing this or was this over here? The colon, um... uh, I did do up until COVID, I did colon hydrotherapy um, cool. and then I lost my premises, lost so access is, to my premises. Is that something that you, you can, you can work with and get through the NHS? Yeah, that I might mean, be worth if doing? he's been, if so, if someone has been cleared so medically, and uh, it's been shown that they don't have an obstruction and there's nothing, you know, like pathological in there, mm -hmm. then in the hands of an experienced practitioner, colon hydrotherapy, you know, may be something that's helpful. But again, they would need yes. to take a full of course, clinical yeah, case yeah, yeah. history to, to make sure that they were happy to do that. And yeah. it would, it might, you know, it would depend off and these things would depend on level of experience, right? Yeah. Interesting, um, interesting. We can, we can certainly talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, so diverting a wee bit there. Yeah. So a couple of times a day should be pooing. Yeah. The, the strength of the poos should be pretty And the sturdy. size. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you've seen the actual just, stool chart, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so so you want ones. a smooth log. I, I weighed one the other day. 
Did you? Aye, uh, because that is commitment. I stepped huh? in the scale. I was seventy nine point six. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, I right. think when you took it, yeah, laid it on the scale. <laughs> no, 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 no. I was, I was like, like, bro, that was like. I what? got up and I usually You're next I, level. Right? Usually they were in between ten minutes, but I had my eggs, had my shower. Mm. Still, no, I hadn't had my eggs yet. Sorry, I had my shower and I was like just getting it. I was like, oh, I need one now, but I was already weighed myself before. So I was 79.6 and then I was 79. It was 0. 0.6 kilo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, I mean, that was, uh, as I felt like, <laughs> honestly, when I've had people uh, in the colon hydrotherapy situation and often people who have been chronically um, uh, constipated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's kilos. <sighs> It's kilos I because what you're doing is you're not it's, you're not <laughs> like you're not pumping it out, but you are hydrating the stool. Often, mm. one of the challenges is is a lack of hydration, right. and some of that can come about, as I say, purely because of lack of water. Mm -hmm. But some of that can also be if someone has been a chronic drinker of tea and coffee, tea in particular, which has a tannin in it, which even when you put milk into tea, it doesn't completely, it reduces the impact of the tannin. But if you've got a good cup of tea, you can still taste the tannin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But tannin, remember, tannin was something that was used in the leather industry to of dry course. Yeah, yeah, the leather. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I've had at least one client who, um, and she's still my client, although we don't do colon hydrotherapy anymore because I'm, as I said, I don't have access to it, who uh, I came to the conclusion with her that that basically she had tanned, she'd almost kind of like leathered the inside of her bowel. Oh, wow. Um, and so it become hydrophobic. So it was repelling the water. Hmm. But it, a lot of it does. So that aside, that was fairly extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, it comes back to things like, are, is the enteric nervous system, are the nerves of the enteric nervous system actually, you know, fulfilling their remit and I'm going like this because they the are what provide yeah. the electrical impulses for the longitudinal and the, the muscles that go round the bowel because mm -hmm. the bowel is a really muscular organ. Yeah. Right? So how are, you, how are you training that with someone? How are you getting them to be aware of those muscles? Is so it, what, what can water. be done? So that's the, that's it's the just... water from the colon. That's why colon, I call it hydrotherapy. Some people call it irrigation. Okay. Um, that's where the water over time as well as hydrating the stool and allowing the stool to leave the body. And we'll talk about that in terms of the mm -hmm. impact of stool being held, poo being held for too long in, mm -hmm. in the gut. Um, it also, because, and again, it has to be done properly, obviously, and you're regulating pressure, of course, and you've got parameters for that. So just that outside hose in the back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> God, I'm sure somebody's this probably tried it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, we do not advocate that. But, you know, that gentle stimulation yeah. against the bowel wall does offer that re-education to the muscles and therefore, by default, to the nerves and wakes them up. And I've seen that. I've seen that over and over and over again, and I'm and any other colon hydrotherapist experience would say that. And that is, what is this coming from? Why why is that then needed for these individuals? Is there any commonalities? Well, I that mean, you see? It, it, we've all got areas of the body that don't function as well as other areas. So, you know, it, it could be that you know maybe maybe they were I don't know. Um, underfed as an infant or as a child in the sense of not given enough bulking bulky foods to actually then get in the bowel and stimulate those muscles and the, the nervous system to, to kind of wake up and do the job. Mm. You know, these things tend to happen in families. Mm. So there may be some, you know, genetic factors oh, that right, we yeah, don't, yeah. we don't actually have mm. an evidence base for yet. As I say, they can't actually do any studies on the nerves of the bowel because ethically you're not going to cut open an organ to mm. to, to study the nerves no, of that bowel when people are alive. It's crazy because you don't think we think of muscles very superficial, yeah. and we don't think about this. So it's like, oh, what exercise can I do to fix that? It's like, well, it actually goes beyond. Yeah, but the, actually, you know, there's a case to say that certain certain movements, uh, you know, ex of your external muscle groups can also play a part because mm. you know these big thigh muscles are attached via the connective tissues to the large intestine. So for Good certain strength, people, yeah. giving them specific therapeutic exercises can be helpful. And this is why I'm sure you would have noticed in, in your career thus far that sometimes when people get moving and they are walking more and using these muscles and they're strengthening them, actually, 
and just like turning on a process sometimes they start them, yeah. actually Jump start saying them. oh I'm, you know yeah i seem to be going to the toilet more than i mm. used to be and you go oh that must be the water or the extra fiber and mm. it might be but it might also be the fact that they are indirectly stimulating yeah. They're about. If there's one thing I've taken away from coaching, for sure, it's definitely not to, like you say, that there's very few times that you can go, oh, it's definitely that. And it's something that I always communicate to my clients. It's like, we don't want to try and change too much so that we can have an easier look at it. But mm. there's generic things that we'll, we will improve, like movement, water intake, sleep. And it could be just a combination blend yeah. of all these different yeah. things. So what's the impacts then of going a couple of days without regularly going to the toilet and what does that have in your overall health yeah so that's um going to mean that you're going to be recycling certain waste metabolites so these metabolites that really have been made during you know the the normal bodily processes and instead of them then being you know shown the back door so to speak mm. they are not only held in the bowel but they are then recirculated via the liver right so and this is a this is a good story um, to to share is that I, I a number of years ago I had a client in her mid twenties who'd been married for a couple of years. They wanted to have a baby. They've been trying for a baby for twelve months, just over twelve months. They're about to be referred to IVF because uh, you know you got to hit that twelve month period. <clears throat> and uh, she only had a about a nineteen day menstrual cycle at that time, nineteen twenty one day something like that. And she only had a bowel motion every three days. So I explained to her how some of her hormonal metabolites were going to be held in the body and then recycled essentially. And that that was going to be what that was going to be the underlying reason why she wasn't having a 28 to 30 day cycle. Mm -hmm. So she kind of, you know, she, she looked at me because of course none of the doctors had explained this before. It was just like, well, you'll have to wait to 12 months and then we'll hand you over to IVF. That's a shame. That's the process. So the first month that we worked together, her cycle was 20, went to 23 or 24 days, something like that. And and because it was like four or five days longer, bless her, she was like, I think I might be pregnant. And I was like, honestly, I uh -huh. don't think you're pregnant. And in the back of my mind, it was like, if you are pregnant at this point, this is not going to be a viable pregnancy because the timing's not, you know, yeah, the timing's right. off. Mm. So it was either the third or the fourth month she was pregnant and she ended up having a beautiful little girl. Amazing. By which time, so so what happened was at the same time as the period changing, it was because she was having a bowel motion, starting to have a bowel motion first every second day, then every day. Nice. And you just don't realize the impact then on your hormonal it's health. It's so simple, yeah. but it's so fucking profound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, as you say, it's not really talked about. No, and and right. so yeah. for men, it might not show up so obviously because obviously you haven't got an external period telling you yeah. like something's changed. Most men wear, wake up with directions and stuff like that and to me that's like indication of testosterone yeah. and all that sort of stuff yeah. so but if they're markers, not yeah. for instance they could be because forget i think men forget sometimes that they can still be they are still making estrogen yeah yeah right? yeah yeah. and if that's not getting removed then you know there's a chance that that could impact things like testosterone levels mm. and you know testosterone gets a really bad rap i think um but but ultimately, if your testosterone levels aren't robust, then you you know that that hasn't that potentially has an impact on things like mental health. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah for absolutely. Sure no, we, we feel that. That's we, why we I started that. getting my my blood work done. So mine came back in normal range, and I, I always forget the the number of where normal range. So normal range can be anything from one thirty up to a thousand, yeah, right? Yeah. Mine's was one three five, yeah. and I was being told normal, and I'm like, yeah. I'm twenty four years old. End. Yeah, yeah. As I'm twenty four years old. That's like I know guys in their forties and fifties that have higher, yeah. higher, Might be higher normal, results. But it's not yeah. optimal, right? Yeah, yeah. So, and this is the this is a difference. So, going back to that story with your client, then with some with some things that are good common practices that people can take away if they are in a situation where they're not regularly having these bowel movements. What's, what's like your so go -to yeah, move? basics first, right? Yeah. So, water movement. How much move? Uh, how much water? Sorry, would you have you saw like making it? People don't like water as well, which is an I know, but you know what? Concept. Tap water tastes like shit. It is horrible. You, you can't, oh, say, you that. Can't, you can't oh. say that moving from England to, to Australia to no, Scotland. No, I hate. No, really? I, I mean to be fair, Scottish water. Yeah, come well, on. Is, is softer. <laughs> it's an identity as well. It's softer. I'm sorry, um, but it isn't coming off the hills. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what they've told you, but it's not coming off the hills, not into our taps. Because and the thing is, some of us have older houses, so I actually had mm. the taps checked in our house to make sure that there was no. I seen like, a video. Of the other day of somebody Mineral, opening um, up a metals a water pipe and i was like 
well, yeah. was that what's in the yeah. water? Well, there's a lot of old houses, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the taste of water, um, so down where I grew up in Wiltshire, I didn't know any different. Mm. But now when I go back down there, I buy bottled water because yeah. I just can't. Yeah. Even the children are like, it doesn't taste good. Mm. And it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's hydrating you mm. because of all the mineral that's in it. It's real calcium rich. Um, but tap water, again, I don't think what people understand is that the chemicals that are used to ensure that tap water has got all the nasty stuff that's in our water supply once it gets back to the plant removed, uh, the, you know, there's some aluminium-based stuff in there, which isn't necessarily going to be great for our brain mm -hmm. in the long run. Um, and as an interesting aside, just after COVID, they um, they stopped funding a massive, there's a ma I can't remember the name of the scientist, I'll have to look it up again, but uh, he's one of the world authorities on aluminium toxicity. Okay. And all this funding got cut. Wow. Um, and an, a byproduct of the aluminium industry is fluoride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, don't, so you, know, don't know much about fluoride. I've heard a lot about it, right. but I don't but we're know. We're lucky because we don't have fluoridation, but they're trying to bring it in. Right. So it's no mistake that his funding got cut. Right, right. right. But my point is that we've got chlorine, obviously, in our, in our water. One of the ways that you can just make the water taste better is by filling up a jug with your tap water and leaving it to sit. Because the chlorine will off-gas right. a little bit. And then open lid type of thing? Or like, does it not just just, just just anything. Leaving. Like I mean, I say a jug because usually it's got a fair... You know, you could put yeah. it. You could leave it in a, a large cup space or whatever. Just any type of receptacle mm. that hasn't got a lid on it. Yeah, that's what I mean. No, yeah. not like filling up a bottle of water and putting it no, in. No, because the again, what we yeah, don't yeah. know about these, yeah, it's, the it's a soft plastic. Yeah. And what we don't know is, um, you know, is it BPA? And even if it isn't BPA, the thing is, there's a lot of other biphosphonols, B to Z. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Um, what did I digress from? So we're talking about things you can do. <laughs> yeah, so I knew that, I digressed. That, 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 I, know, I, mean, I should call this episode just like Louise Westra tangent. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're talking about how to improve your digestion and some of the simple things. So obviously drinking water. Re yeah. it, when it comes down to it, this is, so this is my well, view we're on talking it. about water yeah. flavour, weren't we? Yeah, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. need to put cordial in it, then choose a good quality cordial. You know, I'm, I, I do that with some of my clients who are like, it's I hate water. Yes, exactly. Right, okay. I was like, not, like to be with, not to be confused with fizzy juice that has no nutritional value. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> right, so what I, no, we, right, so we go and... Flavour it, I'm saying. If right, you need no, so what, what about uh, like Diet Coke and Cokes and what's, what's that doing is? So from an evidence perspective, mm -hmm. if we're talking about trying to use a diet alternative drink... In the with the idea that you know we're reducing our consumption of sugar mm -hmm. and therefore trying to avoid things like type 2 diabetes the evidence doesn't show any change so you are your your risk stays the same if you are having one diet fizzy juice yeah versus a full sugar fizzy juice your risk of diabetes is the same yeah because the only way it's looked at in fitness is weight loss isn't it exactly and it can be really compelling, right? When you have got a certain number of, you know, macros and overall calories that you're wanting to stick to, yeah. and you've got that, like, oh, I've never done it today. I haven't, I just haven't been on it. And, and I just, what could I have to try to just get myself through to my next meal? I can understand why people do it, but you could do the same with a little bit of diluting juice and some water. Yeah, of course. I think that's the thing that... Or a sparkling people, water. Yeah, yeah, right? yes, yes. It's the... It's almost it's habitual. The, yeah, it's the habit behind it rather than the actual compound yeah. itself. Um, so water um, is obviously part of this. Getting your bowels moving more regularly. Fiber has a part to play in some, some cases. People. Chewing, chewing, um, making sure that that the you know the start of the process. If if the start of the process is under functioning, mm -hmm. then the end result is going to be under functioning. Yeah. Right. Is it? I remember reading a, or listening to a book years ago. Something. 45 choosers that they've done a, a, what, a 50 odd choosers 40, or something. Yeah, is it 40 yeah. yeah and and again from a from a you know if we're talking about um i prefer to think of it as fat loss i'm mm. sure you guys do them weight yeah, loss yeah. yeah yeah um if we're talking about that as well there some research shows that the signals that you yeah, get, yeah because it gives you longer to feel that you are full mm -hmm. um so 30 to 40 for most and again i i always tell people like just view it as a game 
do it with your family. See who can chew the most, you yeah. know? It's hard with mashed potato. Th <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> th 30 chews for what? For each mouthful. 30 chews for each yeah. mouthful? So, so that's yeah. what I mean to you. I'm having so. a bit four. That's yeah. what I'm saying. So it's yeah. it was. I, I'll send the book because I know you're right. You're not making just the now. most of it. So no, uh, I'm no. I, I'm optimal, just like right. I'm on my mom go. I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit that. I'll yeah. Admit so that. so going beyond that, when it comes to the types of foods and stuff like that, that all would obviously have a part to play. What what would be like a generic sort of foods that you would be looking to encode to to, to get help? the bowel moving? Yeah. To help so with that process. making sure there's a balance of soluble and insoluble fiber. Mm -hmm. Right. So. I'm laughing because I'm going to talk about oats, right? And there's a big thing on Instagram at the moment. Have you seen it about like there's a lot oats of influencers are bad. like oats are bad. I'm like, what are we talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's always from America though, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably, yeah. arguably, their oats is definitely different to the oats yeah. that we have over yeah. here. But oh, um, and, and again, there are some people for, for whom definitely like a, um, a, a big bowl of starch doesn't really work for them because of their genetics. But yeah. generally speaking... Something like oats that has some soluble fiber, you know, in it. I would also suggest that sometimes tweaking what we're doing with prep, right? Mm -hmm. So with oats, if you can add some liquid, whether that's water, um, you know, whatever your choice of milk is um, overnight, then that will actually allow the oats to swell and bring out the soluble fiber and also from a satiety perspective yeah, like a, starting with your eyes mm -hmm. go oh that's a that's a bigger volume uh, yeah, yeah yeah so it can be a nice trick for those of us that do have the labrador genes to go oh i've got more to eat than i thought because when i put those oats into a bowl they only looked about this big and now they've swollen to double the size yeah 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 i never thought i, I honestly never thought about the process of before you're eating and looking and all no, that sort no, of stuff that. and you're you're right like the volume when you look at a salad you're like, okay that's a lot of food yeah. when you break I it down i love it when yeah, i look yeah, at yeah. my food and i'm like oh my god look how much food i've got I know, I know. <laughs> Uh, so <laughs> any other sort of foods out with fiber then are you are, are you looking um, at or so i'm just so resistant starches so for some people again it can be helpful this isn't necessarily to do with fiber like bowel um but it it can be helpful for them to like prepare their say baked potato or sweet potato in advance or their rice, leave it. And then the resistant starch is formed. And then that means when they go back, it's going to be much more regulating for their blood sugar. So that wasn't really a good example for the bowel. I'm just trying to think what else would I say for the bowel? I think in all honesty, I think if people pay attention to and they look at their foods and they realize, oh, you're right. I have one gram of fiber and 60 grams of protein that barely keeps me malnourished no, I, <laughs> the borderline malnourished I, I sometimes look at you know with with my kind of you know i guess more well, my strength journey and i am in a, a group and i look at some of the women who because it is a female based group who you know do prep their meals and and you know i look at the food they're eating and i'm like if i if that was my breakfast i'd be hungry in an hour you know, because it's it's still it's still for me. There's not enough volume. That's the thing for me with loving eating plants as a whole group. That's what it does for me. It's not it's not even about the fiber. Like that's a lovely side effect. Yeah. What I would say is, if you can fall in love with with food, mm -hmm. or at least learn to love certain foods, and maybe add in other things that you don't love as much, yeah, then you can increase that fiber without it feeling like it's laborious. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I get, I get where you're going with it because it's it's something that you can look at the standard bodybuilding approach. It's like oh, I can't believe you have chicken and rice, but chicken and rice is sometimes just still a go-to move for. In fact, it is it's a go-to move for for both of us, and it's not because it's the it, it goes beyond just a taste element. It's also everything else that goes into that. Um, there's enough sodium in it. It's been salted yeah. enough, seasoned. Yeah. Um, I know it's. Um, nutrient wise is feeding me it's actually giving me the the I, I know i'm not gonna have trouble um digesting the food yeah the feeling afterwards and all these sort of things so it goes beyond the oh no i'm craving that food yeah. type of thing so so uh, 
if it's chicken and rice, so I would say to someone, if that's your kind of like, you know, if that's the evening meal that you've decided you're going to eat, you know, for your Monday to Friday, then adding some variation in terms of accompanying veg. Yeah, is it a add uh, so you don't add veg actually don't you you're, you're on the it. low side of things 10 of servings of vegetables a day james <laughs> 10 servings yes, a day of non-starchy vegetables a day what's the, what, so what, what's a non-starchy vegetable i'll start adding it so so your starchy vegetables are like your potatoes sweet potatoes right, 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 yeah, your yeah, yeah, swedes yeah, yeah. your neeps yeah, yeah. all that stuff um so anything like you know your your all your different color peppers right um uh spinach um all the stuff that's above the ground I'll start. Actually. I'll start adding it from tomorrow. So a good. I heard you talk about this, and this is a fantastic strategy because I think in the the modern world just now, it's like there is a big part of why protein powders are used more because it's convenience. And I heard you talking about not meal replacement shakes, but a a shake or a blend of a juice. Uh, no, was it was that what you would call it? Like a yeah, a so good, good, like good food. So no, blended up. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Smoothie. Smoothie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's so hard. Okay. Not smoothie in the sense of the ones you buy for the shop, but one that you. <laughs> the so what would be like a balanced smoothie in terms of things that's like a good go to thing for you? So I actually don't eat smoothies that much. Oh, do you not personally? Not, right, okay. Because I like food. Yeah. <laughs> No, don't get me wrong. A smoothie, I I will use a smoothie bowl, like usually in the warmer months, as as a meal. Mm -hmm. Um, but it still has to have stuff in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it has to feel like a proper meal for Mm me. So it still needs to have some. For me, it still needs to have some protein. So that could be, um, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of whey. Yeah. You know, it's. I think it's so overlooked now with all the plant based stuff out there. But again, from a making sure we've got the full spectrum of amino acids and so on. You can't go past whey. I feel a lot of people these days are very, they, they struggle with milk and they struggle with whey products. What's your what's your take on why that might be? You're one of them actually. Oh, you, you well, can you not do whey? Skin ah. breaks out. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You, digestion. I mean, I wonder whether or not you are lactose intolerant. No, so it's, I, I, I years ago, I went to, I can't remember because I was that young and they uh-huh. said I was lactose intolerant. Yeah. They'd done the test and I couldn't have MSG yeah. or lactose and something in smoked sausages. Don't know what it was. Okay. Sucks to be you. That's uh, what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. But I feel oh, no, like that's more common. Is, it, is, this a, is there a myth around well, I when mean, you remove it from your diet, you well, lose the enzymes well, and stuff think, like that? I think to the process first thing it. is that remember that whey doesn't exist alone in nature. Right, it is part of. So, if you put aside someone who's got an overt problem with dairy products, you know, we are taking we're taking whey out of you know what was a whole food, mm. and we are isolating it, aren't mm. we? Um, so that that could be part of it. Um, I haven't really. Yeah, I. I mean, I I use a variety of different. So, so one of the things I say to people is, look, variety is key. The more variety that you have in your diet. Putting aside something that is a definite allergy or, you know, whatever, you are less likely to react to it. One of the biggest reasons why people react to food is because they use it excessively. Yeah, which would make sense in in the front of it. So some kind of protein. Yeah. Okay. Um, And then some good fat. So a little bit of avocado. Mm. Um, Again, people so don't like avocado, but you won't taste it in a smoothie. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, adding in some, you know, I'm not a big fan of people adding then concentrated juices. You, you know, a lot of oh, people yeah, that, that and coconut weird. waters and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, like I will either, I will sometimes use some kind of milk mm. um, or water, mm. but I don't add juice to no. a smoothie. Yeah. Yeah, like apple juice and that, that was like a go-to for the flavour for... I know, yeah, apple juice is full of sugar. But you can, you know, you, the, one of just the great... Just add apples. <laughs> yeah, one of the great... Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah, so yeah. then you've got the sweetness and you've also got some of the fibre. And that's the great thing about the smoothie is it will keep in the fibre of the plant material. Mm. And of course, then you've got lots of fancy stuff you can add as you like cherries on top. So <laughs> you want to get some blue spirulina to make it look a beautiful colour for your children or, you know, um, varying degrees of green powder. Although the best green powders, they don't taste good enough to, to put in a, and drink, exactly. eat a whole smoothie yeah. Yeah. of 
in my opinion. That's right? you know, you've Is that what you've got good. Looking at the yeah, so it's supposed so to green smell. powders are meant to. It's right? sort of like a buzz term in our in our space just now. Is there a myth with when you blend up a protein shake or blend up a shake with your berries and your whatever it is that you're putting into it? Do you lose anything by not digesting that by just eating it? Yeah, it's a is great it, question. Is, is there is that a myth or is it? Well, I th- again, if we're talking about from a satiety perspective, humans are designed to experience their food with their teeth, right? Mm. To tear mm. and to bite. Right. So if we don't have that, there are some people again, probably with particular genotypes with more of the, you know, mTOR you know, not as easily satisfied, who maybe then a smoothie doesn't hit the spot because that stage in the process, in the supply chain, was missing. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. But I think for some people, it it doesn't seem to matter at all. My main, my I guess one of my main issues with smoothies is that people, you know, and it, it's similar to, um, you know, when people are like, oh man, do you know where to get uh, protein Snickers or protein? <laughs> and it's like, mate, just put some peanut butter on a bit of toast, you'll get more protein from that. It's, it's but it, again, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. And, and you would be better off concentrating on, you know, getting some food, decent quality food mm-hmm. on a plate and learning how to cook for yourself. Yeah, of course, of course. As a life skill, right? As a life skill. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm, I'm conscious of time here as well. There's so much that, that, that we had for I know, you. I, know, I wanted I know. to go into. Um, what, and one thing, I, the reason I came to miss there, because you said something on a podcast, and I was like, oh, I was told that is like a, like a, it's like a, it's what your mum or dad said to you when you're younger, like eat your carrots because it'll make you see in the dark. And then you were talking about how carrots and um, can help the the retina and all this sort of stuff. Do you, Is there any like good food fairy tales and stuff that, uh, that that is true on that front then so like carrots and that sort of stuff like i don't know what i was saying but i you know going back to my point about beta carotene so beta carotene is pro vitamin it's known as pro vitamin a so it makes people think if i eat carrots that will take care of my eyes Mm. right because vitamin a is really important for eye health yeah Yeah, yeah, it makes you see in the dark and and to be fair in the second i think it was the second world war they did feed the pilot some of the pilots i think it was bilberries which is a purple really polyphenol rich uh, beta carotene rich berry that is you know in in the uk Mm. and apparently it was helpful but again if you've got that genetic variant where you can't convert the pro vitamin a the beta carotene into retinol into active vitamin a then carrots actually aren't going to help you to strengthen you know and support your eye health Mm. right so that is a fallacy. And that comes back to, I think, the terminology of people just go, oh, pro-vitamin A. Uh, um, that's taking care of my vitamin yeah, A. Yeah, and you're forgetting all these but Again, what you need stones. probably is mm. to make sure that you're hedging your bets. If you don't know the ge- your genetics, hedge your bets and take some cod liver oil through winter. Mm. Interesting. You'll get some vitamin D in there as well. Remember, you, were too, you guys are too young to remember, but you know, a couple of generations ago, everyone used to get kind of Spoons. force-fed <laughs> a horrible cod liver oil. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't have it. Yeah. Um, but you know, now we're very fortunate that those things have got, you know, like a, a lemon oh, flavor or an orange flavor, or they can be in a capsule. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to taste them. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is where, as I say, I feel like animal foods are, there's a tendency in some, by some people to malign them and dismiss them. Uh, when, you know, again, we are, we are omnivores. Yeah. That's where we've, our heritage comes yeah. from and. That there has to be something that's said to how ancestrally we've lived and all those little historical mechanisms will advance as we age and yeah, yeah. through generations, through DNA. So if, if, some, if stress can affect your unborn child from being in your belly, what else do we pass through through yeah. generations, which is, which is fascinating? What's your biggest frustrations with the health and fitness space, health, fitness and well-being space was something that you... Oh, I think did, we've run out of time. Die, <laughs> yeah. Go, go, go. If, yeah. you, if you had to like, die, die by a point, you, you're mentioning something off, off air with the, the post that you'd done yesterday with the, the sort of individualised camps, like yeah. pick this food group and that. Is that something that's probably high up in your priority list? It, it, it is these blanket statements, you know, that, that look great on social media because somebody can then come across with such conviction 
you know, they they it's like they've hung their, you know, petard, I think they call it, and you know, like this that's that it. This is me. And, and people love certainty, don't they? I mean, mm. I totally get it from a psychological perspective. If you're in a survival, and this is going back to what you're saying about evolution, you know, when you're in a situation where you, as humans, we need to have someone who's leading through in the front, who's very clear about what needs to happen. So when we see those people, it's like that is attractive to, to, to the human psyche. <laughs> That person, they're very sure about that certainty. Okay. Conf just yeah. confidence. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm, they know where they're, what they're saying. So I, I, I buy into that. So that is that is frustrating because it's so unnuanced. Mm. And then the other thing that's really uh, pisses me off is people not knowing their scope of practice. And I, I mean that in every, you know, in every sense. In the, you know, back years ago, uh, this was in Australia had a client who she was chronically chronically constipated and had been constipated her whole life and she now had had a number of diagnoses of like chronic inflammatory conditions and she was told we, you know we we said look this is going to take a while to unpack it's not going to be something that's going to be done in you know even a year a oh, week transformation. Right. Oh, okay. Let's get to that. I mean, let, let, let's let's be honest. An eight week or a twelve week transformation. We hope, don't we? As as it's going to as, change our life. Well, what we what we hope is it will be the start of changing life aye, because aye. it starts to build some habits. But it's not going to no. do fuck all if someone's just wanting to look a certain way for that photo shoot and then gorge yeah. themselves on a biscuit at the end, yeah. and then you know go back to to overdoing. <laughs> Um, but scope of practice. So, so this particular woman was so invested in the opinion of her GP that she took back some information to the GP because we said, you know, we need to start really, really gently. We'll make you up some herbs. So I we haven't mentioned it, but my MSc is in Western Herbal Medicine. Mm -hmm. And we would like to start you with, you know, a really gentle course of colonics and just see what changes. Like, let's just give the body some time and space to see what it could do differently with some signaling from the core, you know. So you went back to the to the GP and the GP stood up and said, um, oh, yeah, you know, by all means, give that a try, but it will probably kill you. What? <laughs> like, how the fuck do you know? Have you ever given anyone a colon hydrotherapy treatment? Like, yeah. there is actually uh, no evidence for the efficacy of colon hydrotherapy treatment, but there's also no evidence to the contrary because the fact is that no one's done any research yeah. in a in that particular, you know, way. So all we have is, um, you know, reports from people like me uh, collected anecdotal mm. evidence. But all that evidence starts it like should not that. Be, it should not be dismissed. Right. Because... It's the it's we anecdotally will will train clients in a way, and it's like well, it's how you learn. Right? Uh, yeah, it's like don't do squats because they're or don't do deadlifts because they're bad for your back. And it's like, well, why don't put your yeah. knee over your yeah, yeah like, to your oh, toe. Work within this kind of fixed <laughs> format. Life isn't life isn't like yeah. that. So um, yeah, you so know, if you like don't there. know, yeah, yeah. if you haven't experienced something as a practitioner, then you need to remain open minded and equally, you know. It, I mean, I've got clients that ask me to work with them through, say, a cancer diagnosis. And at that point, I will say that is outside of my scope of practice. I have an integrative oncologist that I can refer you on to. And, uh, you know, I can definitely sit alongside you on this journey. Yeah, you have a part to play that you yeah, can help. Uh, but aid. I'm now yeah. in a supporting role. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, and I think what's not clear on social media is that some people who do have definitely experience that is relevant to the health and well-being space, but people don't realize that they've never treated a human. Mm. So yes, some of the information that they are imparting is very, very valuable, but it's up to a point. So what's happening to those people who are then like, wow, this person is so amazing and then they reach a point where they're like well hang on that's not working why isn't that working for me mm -hmm. but in their mind that person is so high on a pedestal but they're like well Just you know that that per yeah, right yeah. that person knows everything so so no one else is going to be able to help me mm. that's the danger yeah it's social media is a is a dangerous place but as a consumer consuming it i think we all have a responsibility to, to really control Do, what we but digest. people don't know what i know it's hard know. to cut which is why we, we we have this podcast we want to bring yeah. people we like yourselves we were debating the other day 
I can't remember what it was, but it was like, I can't remember. It was something like, this is this, but we have responsibility. But at the same time, yeah. most people don't understand that that is a responsibility because yeah. they don't know it. Yeah. No, and even I recently, in the last couple of weeks, had this where it suddenly occurred to me that, and, and actually it was Gary Brecker, who I think is is incredible um, in his background. And it suddenly occurred to me, I was like, but Gary Brecker has never been a practitioner. Yeah, that's it. so we, we see it, these yeah, sweeping it? statements right. of these are the two blood tests. Oh, see, these are the two tests you you will only ever need to look at methylation and your blood tests. It's nonsense, and in it, it perpetuates. Someone of that caliber should not be perpetuating yeah. a lack of nuance. But it's like to and sell shares. products. <laughs> it's to shares. sell. This is. I think this is the biggest challenge with people, and and probably more so in your scope of practice, where there's. Um, a great deal of knowledge, understanding of biologically what's happening. They know a lot when it comes to the scientific research, the medical field, but there is real world practice and experience that needs to be looked at as well. And I think having that approach is so vital to your whole scope of practice. And like you said, holistically looking at everything, you might know all these stepping stones and how the the, the vitamins are, are digested, but it could be something uh, well, it might not be something out with that, but you need to take into those those considerations, like you said, that not just missing that. Okay, here, take this and that's you type of thing, or do this and that. That's the yeah. be all and end all. Same with fitness, like people ju- see the online coaching space. Oh, that's great! I I can co- I can make people lose weight from Bali, and they jump on that, but they've never trained people in person. It's like, why are you not getting to the gym when the reality of our job is? helping people gain confidence walking through the gym doors not lifting the weights not helping them do the exercise there's more to it than a piece of paper saying do eight reps of this set yeah exactly exactly it's it's crazy and um so yeah so much that we probably if you're up for it coming back on because i wanted to get into women's hormonal health Mm. menopause periods uh, I think as two guys, we have a, a duty to, <laughs> to for our for our female that's audience. No, for sure. That's no our scope of practice. Yeah, <laughs> oh, but to a degree, to a degree, it's one of the reasons that I talk about you know what's happening in my body in a natural way when it comes mm-hmm. up. Like if one of my boys walk into the bathroom and mm-hmm. I've got my period, yeah. and they're like. And the youngest one is still like, what is that again, mummy? Are you all right? And I'm yeah. like telling it's okay. You don't need to panic. This is a period. You know, we, we mask it with humor, those guys. And, it's like, oh, and it's I think that's, a, fl- that's yeah, okay yeah, yeah. to have yeah. a lightness of touch. But I think it's really, really important that more men feel confident discussing various stages of hormonal, a woman's hormonal life so that they don't necessarily fall into that trap of like, you know, putting their foot in it, not meaning to, but also being able to encourage. And also, you know, this is what I want for my boys as well. I don't want them to accept that, you know, the woman or, you know, let's say it's going to be, a, let's say it is a female uh, moving forward in their life who they choose as their partner and, and vice versa, that they're an emotional wreck for half the month. Yeah. And that that's, it, that's actually, that's, just a, that's a fait accompli. Yeah. Because it, it's not. That's that's the normal so as we talk about. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm totally here for that. Yeah, so oh, I love um, it. I like and, that. and I think I'll, I'll put all your where people can find you in the, in the show notes and that. Um, but your book as well is, is called You First. And so many of us are people pleasers and we put other people's, particularly like if you look at women, women will put others first, like their kids and that. And I think that's a big part to play on the hormonal impact that, that they have. And the reason I'm, I'm going so hard on the 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 female side of things is because majority of people that we end up helping is, is usually is is females and yeah. i think when we had heather on when she was speaking about her um whole uh experience with trying to figure out why her period pains were so uh, excruciating painful I, I, it's like a light bulb went off went off in my head i was like that almost sounds like majority of the clients that i've had yeah and why is that the new normal and then hearing what you spoke about i think you've got a lot to um, to dive into more in that, so we'll definitely get you on again with that. Um, so I, so I think we'll, we'll wrap things up. <laughs> no, thank aye, you for thank you for f- coming down and um, time. Yeah. It's great to have you on the podcast. We probably diverted a lot from you guys mm. listening, but selfishly, uh, hopefully you, you would have got a lot from this podcast for sure. Thank so you for having thank me. You. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you. It was great. It was fantastic. Awesome. I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs>